Welcome everyone to day two of Career Bootcamp 2023. This morning's session, depending on where you are, is called Regional Career Development in a Hybrid World. Please note that this session is offered both in French and English simultaneously. So to view the French session, please return to the agenda and click on the link for Le Développement de Carrière en Région dans le monde hybride. I'd like to acknowledge that I am here on the Mi'kmaq territory. The Mi'kmaq have lived here since time immemorial. And I encourage you to take a moment to think about where you are on, on your land as well. Career Boot Camp is the largest conference in the GC and the only goal is to support you and your career journey. As we move through today's sessions, please ask your questions to the panelists using the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen. You can vote for questions that you like by clicking the thumbs up button. And with all FIN sessions, this session will be recorded so that you can go back and view the recordings and gather the insights. Please note that the opinions and experiences of our guests are their own and not necessarily that of the GC, but we rigorously choose our guests depending on their subject knowledge and their experiences. Without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to our moderator and panel. Thank you, Jen. Um, hello, everybody. Um, who's excited for this career bootcamp? Pretty sure you guys are enjoying the sessions that the, they have presented us and you know what? Um, I attended mine back in 2019 and I haven't stopped attending till yet. Um, so thank you, Finn, for having us here and host, um, you know, actually putting this session on the table. Um, my name is Prerna. I'll be the moderator for this session. And um, I started, so I worked with the CRA, started with the federal government in 2016 as a fluke, did not want it to be here. Med school was on the plan government was never on the plan. So, but I'm here today after how many years? Seven years, maybe? Um, I don't know. Can't count. Um, so I started with the agency back in 2016, progressed myself, worked in different departments, um, collections, human resources, public affairs. Now, currently I'm in security. Don't tell anybody because I haven't said anything. So you guys are the first one to know, actually. Um, but yeah, uh, this is who I am. And without further ado, the, you know, people that we actually, oh, sorry, the learning objectives, I forgot those. So in this session today, we're going to be validating which types of role must be done in the NCR or headquarter region and why. Uh, we'll also justify certain roles to be done from any, can be done from anywhere. I mean, literally, haven't we seen the past two years in the pandemic? Like, seriously, people. Um, and the lastly, we're going to demonstrate how working in a region can add value to the employer and I think the employee. <laughs> so our first panelist today will be Jasmine Garcia Larouche. Hello, Jasmine. <laughs> um, she was born in Jonquier to a Quebecois dad and Filipina mom. Um, then her mom family moved up around West Africa, Central America. And she later lived in Haiti and China. She was raised in both French and English, but has been exposed to so many other languages. She kind of picked up all of them. Oh, and she married an Italian, acquired the EU citizenship to complicate things further. Guess what, Jasmine? I'm also fluent in four languages. We got some competition going. All right. <laughs> so she cultivates a passion for the federal government. Um, and, um, you know, she has done, she's worked with so many organizations. She started with the passport officer in Montreal, moved to the learning as a, as a learning specialist to get to know, um, and then global affairs. Wow, we got to talk. Um, and then finally decided she no longer wanted to specialize in training and was hired at Treasury Board for a chance at making a difference on a public service wide scale. And now she's very, 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 very happy to be at ESCC. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Jasmine. Our next panelist is Alan Tam. So Alan works as a team leader in BDSB Specialized Processing Center in Calgary, Alberta, where he's responsible for overseeing apprenticeships, grants, programs, operations, ooh, mouthful, and surge capacity workloads such as pension operations, temporary foreign worker program. Um, he's the lead of Youth Mandate for Greater Involvement Western Region, a consulting member of uh, Y-M-A-G-I-N, um, don't know what they stand for, maybe Ellen, 
elaborate on that when you're talking. Uh, <laughs> sorry, National Executive Team, Steering Committee Member of Oxygen Network, Alberta Finn, and a member of Call Center and Specialized Processing Operations Committee. He is a joint learning program facilitator as well. And he started with ESDC back in June, 2008. Welcome to be here. And lastly, we have Natasha Kote-Khan. Um, Natasha is one of the Canada's free agents who lives in London, Ontario. She is a Transport Canada free agent posted to Infrastructure Canada. She has been a regional employee who has been working remotely since 2018 leading Flex GC, a community of pr practice for the federal government of Canada on the modernization of the public service. Natasha is very passionate about the future of work. Um, <clears throat> currently, Natasha is working at INFC in the infrastructure secretariat, supporting hybrid implementation for that department. Sorry, guys, I had to cut your bios a little bit short. No hard feelings. I love you all. <laughs> so... Now that, you know, we've introduced ourselves, let's get on with, you know, why we're actually here. We're here to learn. So, um, Alexa, if I can please ask you to put our first poll up, please. So, before we get started, um, is your team mostly in the same city, regionally dispersed, national or nationally dispersed? And has working remotely during the pandemic brought in your network? Not at all through your department, through the whole GC. See, my team, uh, they don't work in the same city. They're dispersed nationally. Um, and has working with Barnier Network, definitely I can connect with people. You know, it's so easy nowadays to actually just, you know, hop on a phone call or do MS Teams. You know, people you haven't met before, just get on. You can see them face to face now. So great. Um, and MS Teams, Zoom, all these fancy stuff have made it easy to actually broaden my network. Um, and I get to see Jen and everybody else so, so often that I never did before. <laughs> so these are, oh, wow. It's okay. So mostly in the same city, regionally dispersed, nationally. Dispersed. So a little bit of, you know, all over the place. Um, not at all. Wow, we need to talk. Those 35% people, we need to talk. Not at all. That's not good. Um, through your department, fantastic. Through the whole GC, 19% still a little small. Maybe those 35% people and 19% people need to, you know, get on with the Twitter world, social media world, or just connect with me. Just connect with me. Um uh, so let's get started and I'll pass the, um, so we have a little bit of questions here for the panelists just to get started. And so you can also think about the questions that you want to ask the panelists. So I highly encourage you to put your questions in um, and vote, like Jen said, you know, the more, the more questions get voted, um, questions with the most vote will win. There you go. So first question for Natasha and Jasmine, are you guys ready? I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. So what types of jobs must be done in person? I'll ask Natasha to go first and maybe then Jasmine. Sure. Um, so thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. And I'm happy to talk about this because as a regional remote full-time away from Ottawa employee, this really resonates with me. And uh, working in FlexGC, seeing all the kinds of um, you know, different types of working uh, jobs that have come through the government of Canada since we started really exploring this through um, what the work that I do, which is user experience. It's been really fascinating. So um, I am a human centered designer and I do uh, user experience uh, methodology for my research and for uh, the work that I do for hybrid implementation on the return to occupancy. Um, and through the work that I've done, um, I've been able to learn from employees just by having conversations with them and understanding like how they work and what it is that they do, that not all job functions require to be on site. 
There are some though that do have some operational requirements. And through the user experience that I've learned, um, those jobs are either transactional in nature, um, require some security uh, presence of their, of their position. So their job requires like confidentiality and their security clearance would usually align with that for the work that they're doing. Um, and then there's jobs in the field, which we see all over the regions. Um, and those are an on-site presence too, even though they're not in a brick and mortar building. So for instance, there are border security guards that work on site, but they're actually in a little booth at the border, <laughs> but that's their office and they're on site. Um, we see transportation engineers and technicians who are working on railway, on airplanes, on uh, measuring scales across the country. And there's so many jobs like that where they are working on site, but they're not actually uh, NCR brick and mortar buildings. So um, there are many different ways to sort of analyze what jobs must be done in person, what shouldn't be. One of those is the position assessments. And I know that Jasmine's going to talk about that. So I'll pass the mic to her. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so similar to you, happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Wonderful job, Federal Youth Network. I'm coming to you from the unceded territory of the Anishinaabeg. Um, I came originally from the regions and I made the very bold and silly move now, I think, uh, to move to the National Capital Region for career purposes, because the reality in the regions is very, very different, friends, than it is in the National Capital Region. The opportunities are not the same. It's just two different worlds for me. Um, I, I come from a nationally dispersed team. We go from coast to coast to coast. So this virtual business is very, very good for us. Um, and for those of you who are having problems connecting online and building that culture, uh, there are pilots out there that are randomizing one-on-ones. So instead of like meeting people in the kitchen or in the washroom in the hallway, you actually force that interaction by meeting people from outside your branch or even within your branch if your branch is super large, just to make sure that you keep a connection going. So happy to discuss that further. That being said, to Natasha's point, yes, job functions analysis has been a vital part of this planning on the return to work. We have had to decide whether our jobs have, were on-site, hybrid, or predominantly off-site. And to do that, as the SDC, um, we had to examine what kind of work was being done. And for on-site functions, uh, we looked at the, the physical requirements. Do you require a lab? Do you require access to specific e equipment? That would determine whether or not you were on site. Uh, if you're hybrid, uh, functions such as research, mostly intellectual functions, evaluation, um, translation, procurement, a policy program, some of our capacity could be done in hybrid fashion. Um, and for the predominantly offsite, like you never have to go back to work. Some call centers operate now remotely completely uh, at full capacity and are performing super well. Uh, reporting analytics, um, some financial services, communications, all of those jobs can be done completely remotely. So it's a wonderful thing for us, um, but every department is different. There is no one size fits all, and we have to be able to represent our diversity of jobs and of people and of talent. So I'm going to close with that. Thank you, Perna. Thank you for those lovely answers. Um, we'll move on to the next question. What tasks are better done with colleagues in person? And I'll ask for a request kindly, Natasha and Alan. Um, maybe Alan can go first and then Natasha. And um, thank you, uh, Finn, for organizing this career bootcamp and talking about the regional uh, career development in the hybrid workplace because that is so into the heart of us. And just build on what Natasha and Jasmine mentioned about too, the job functions, the, the needs, we need to be flexible, are not one size fits all. So what time will be better to be done with um, colleagues in person? Well, so there are some of the examples, collaboration on the project ideas. Sometimes, yeah, team is our platform. We have the virtual hand, we have the whiteboard, but is it actually can sparkle your idea? Can it be brainstormed effectively? Well, collaboration on a team idea in a big board room with all the posters around and all the sticky notes around may be a good idea to move around to think about what ideas to move forward, to physically 
C. Oh, this task will use the Kanban method to okay the task number one. Now we can move on to the next one. So this may be a good task to be done in person. The next one is hands-on training. I like to use an example from the Kirkwood Group of the Foundation Services on distinguishing on distinguishing the, the, the mail, um, the date stamp, which brand, which mail should go to work. Um, to train it on teams, yes, we can. All right, Alan, I'm just going to cut you off. I think people are having a hard time hearing you, so maybe have your mic a little bit. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, thank you. So, um, right, on doing the training, the hands-on training, uh, indicating the, 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 the physical mail, for example, uh, it may be better to train in, in person to have that real feel. Okay, if we need to see a certain particular uh, physical pieces, then go to here. This particular piece that you will see go to there, right? And then the other thing too is um, onboarding and orientation. We can definitely do it virtually, no problem, but have those meaningful moments to be on site and going through, oh, this is a computer. If we need to work from home, okay. This you this this are the ports you need to use. This is a docking station. When you are at home, this is how you assemble. It will be better to be do in person. And when you are um, doing the orientation and welcome you on site um, in person, you will feel you're part of the organization. You will feel that you're part of the group. It increase uh, it will increase the success rate that you are. Uh, you're able to job, do that job um, successfully and also can keep the team tight as well, increase morale eventually. Okay, I think it's my turn. Um, <laughs> so like for when I think of what tasks are better done with colleagues in person, there are definite benefits to doing things in person with other people. It's not to say that things can't be done hybrid or remotely though. Um, so when I was talking about some of those position assessment uh, jobs, the transactional people who are doing um, positions that require some of that security stuff behind the uh, screen that wouldn't translate well from working from home, those positions are better in the office. And they, they've just said it's easier for process. It's easier to get a task done. Um, and your colleagues who you're working with typically are in the same kind of position and you're able to get it done together. And so um, that would be sort of, to me, like the optimal um, in-person thing for your job. When I think of culture and how we can build that as a community, um, coming in with colleagues in person sometimes is better to do that. Uh, there, it's nice to meet people and see people. And I would argue that a lot of us who are working in the region would love the opportunity to go in once in a blue moon and meet our colleagues that we're working with and do a team building event um, or an innovative and brainstorming or a team building, a retreat, anything that would bring people together to do that collaboration that you don't get to do um, apart. That's not to say that you can't do it apart though. I have been working this way for five years now and I'm a UX designer. And so there's a lot of innovative things and brainstorming things, design jam things that I have to do in my job. And I've been able to facilitate it with technology. I think that if you don't have the skills uh, when it comes to what technology to use, and you don't know how the know-how on how to build relationships, then probably going on site would be a better option for you. Um, but there are ways to intentionally learn and build that. And I think we're going to be talking more about that in a second. So I'm going to pause there, put a pin in it until we move on to the next question. Thank you, Natasha. Um, well, talking about the next question. How does distance affect team culture and relationship? And I'll ask again, Natasha and Alan to take a jab at it. We'll start with Natasha and we'll pass to Alan. Okay. Sure. So I started sharing a little bit that, you know, culture is nurtured in person. So when we're working at FlexGC and when we're implementing hybrid um, across departments, we're talking to each other about how we can nurture our culture and build our relationships with our colleagues in a hybrid context. Hybrid context is, is it's the old normal and the new normal mixed together, right? So it's two different working models. It's on site and it's in 
uh, a remote and you're mixing the two together. One is easy because you're just going up to someone going, hey, how are you? You want to have a coffee? Because you're sitting right next to each other in a cubicle. The other one is, has to be a little bit more intentional. And this is where the skill building comes in. So you can do it virtually and remotely. You just legitimately need to know how to do it. Um, some people are successful at it and they can build that skill set and, and others need to learn that skill set. But it's not to say that we can't all do it. Um, so uh, what I find is the hardest for cross-cultural relationship building for people to learn is the cross-branch, cross-teams, cross-department culture and relationship building. That is not easy if your job doesn't allow you to have sort of intersectionalities with other teams. And so um, learning how to do that through social media, through branding yourself, through your LinkedIn, um, and trying to make contacts and connections through um, the work that you do and looking for other people who are working on similar things to talk and learn from each other and create those virtual coffee spaces is something that you can do. We've seen across in some departments, they're, do, they're using the technology that we have to create the space virtually for people to do this. Um, so that they can continue to connect and collaborate if you're in the regions and not able to go to the NCR all the time and try and keep things a little inclusive by doing things that way. Um, and uh, they use sort of like the Teams chat channel. There, I've seen water coolers, people using SharePoint, people creating departmental wide um, chats where people can solution solve together and and find uh, solutions to things like, even in the NCR, like I live in Nepean, you live in Nepean, do you want a carpool? We'll save some money on parking. We don't work together, but we work in the same department. And now we've just built a relationship. So there are ways to do it. I think uh, some of it needs to be supported and nurtured by the department and facilitated by them to enable the employees to be able to use these uh, spaces. Some of it is learning the skill on how to do it. Some of it is personal branding. Um, and some of it is uh, done through a team-based uh, environment. When I'm working in hybrid implementation, and a lot of you have already experienced this, um, there are team charters that you can use. Uh, to help facilitate some of that relationship building just through conversation and it it can help support some of the relationship things that you would need to get your business done in a day so like what we're doing in our business operations but it also can be a little informal and break the ice and get to know each other like um, you know maybe you like skiing I like skiing too I didn't know which is like we're figuring that out as we're as we're chatting and going through that exercise so um, sharing and relationship building is hard. And I would say that like, it is it is kind of a personality trait so, to some degree. Um, you're either like an extrovert or you're an introvert and, and sometimes it can feel forced and weird. But once you figure it out and you become a little more comfortable with it, it does become easy to build those relationships regionally with people anywhere. And uh, I think that I'm, I'm kind of living proof of that. I've been able to make friends. Uh, Mark, the, Jen, who introduced the session this morning, uh, just now, uh, we met for the first time, uh, I think it was like six months ago in person, but we have worked together for like three years and it felt like I was seeing my friend for like the hundredth time, not the first time. Um, so we can build relationships this way. Awesome, thank you, Natasha. I really like your virtual coffee idea because it's what I'm doing these days. And the easy coffee chat or the kitchen chat in a hybrid environment, you just need to have a different take on that. Can we take it virtually? Can we use those tools? In a moment, we will talk about that as well, right? You mentioned about the team charter. Just that everyone know team charter is available on the DC campus for you to use. So it's a very good tool for not just hybrid teams, but for virtual team as well on how to build those connections, relationship, uh, not just in the future, but the current moment. Uh, are there any ground rules, right? So you can have the connections and create and maintain those relationships. So the question asking us is what does distance affect team culture and relationships? In a re in my region, um, in a region as big as Western Territories, which is anywhere west of Ontario and in the in the Northern Territories, right? If you just fly from Vancouver to Winnipeg, 
takes you three hours. How can you create a relationship and know each other, right? In the first, you will sense team may not be as tight as a normal in-person team. Um, but the use of virtual platform that Natasha mentioned, using the virtual chat, using Teams, using the different platforms that, that assist you, that will help you. Right now, these days, we have WebEx, we have Teams, we have Zoom. That will break the barrier of seeing each other. Seeing each other. Um, maybe some folks that uh, joined um, the Federal Public Service before um, the virtual work is thinking about we need to meet let's say I'm in Calgary, I'd like to uh, have a video conference to meet someone in Victoria. We need to scramble around to locate a uh, video conference facility. But now with the use of a computer, you are able to just easily make the connection, just call the person you have the camera on, boom, you're able to see the person and, and create that connection. Um, yes, in Harvard, your team may not be as organic and it's it should be, and you will need to make some effort and some time to know each other. It is okay. If you need to take more time, just take the time to create those connections. But at the same time, I think the team that you're with uh, needs to be done collectively and yourself as well. Um, Natasha mentioned, and in the day one, I recall, in the career bootcamp mentioning how to promote yourself with social media. These social media, these social platform and softwares, um, that able to uh, let you connect online will assist to build those culture and relationship with the coworkers and whoever that you would like to meet with. Okay. Thank you, Alan and Natasha, for that insightfulness. Um, I can relate completely. I mean, I use those tools. Like I said, I'm working in BC, but my you know my team is nationally dispersed branches nationally dispersed so how do we connect we utilize the tools that have been provided to us ms teams like Anil said you know alan said ms teams um even twin twitter or linkedin i mean i can just message somebody if i'm connected with them i can just message somebody and create that culture you know create that relationship and that's how you build your network just say <laughs> all right thank you i will move on to um, one of the questions before we move, uh, before we take uh, questions from the audience. So um, for this one, I'll ask Jasmine and Alan. Um, maybe Alan can go first and then Jasmine. Um, so the question is, what do you think the long-term future work will look like from a physical aspect? Okay, so I'll see and sense to in the office there are possibly more quiet rooms and quiet pods because in the hybrid um, working environment we will have some of the meetings maybe virtual some of them maybe in person or just part of the people will be in virtual and uh, you'll be on site so more quiet rooms and pods for calls and also we will start to make use of different uh, virtual collector collaborative platforms team and that's forms uh, sharing notes during one note sharing one point some of the I think the national group too they would like to also always share the one note so everyone will be on the same page rather than keep printing the, the paper print out and okay here you go one at a time on um, those um, situation printing out minutes and agenda I haven't seen it for a long time even for me taking notes using um, sticky notes sometimes on site, it's okay, it's getting a little bit weird. I used to use my computer all the time, right? We need to, we have our laptops, so they'll be uh, used more and more. So more electric plugs in the office, more USB ports in office for you to stay connected and charge your uh, computer device. Or if some of you have um, organized, say, provided iPhone or a mobile device, they will really need it right, for you to stay connected. Um, and also one of the things too is with us able to work in hybrid, well, in Canada is a really big country from coast to coast to coast, and we always know um, there will be one of those scenarios, right? Not only in summer, but in winter as well. Let me provide you um, some 
tens of fees, you may save your travel trip in this uh, long term, what we would like to see. Thanks. Yeah, Alan's totally right. The future is digital. Um, we have to be paperless, we have to be online. Um, this increases some of the aspects of like equity. I love the image of all uh, of us being here in equal little squares. You know, um, we, we not one of us has a bigger office. Nope, we have the same square. So we're, we're equal in that sense. So I love that. Um, from a physical perspective, what the long term future of work will look like, we're not sure, but we know that there are tendencies and a lot of them are being driven by our environmental commitments. We, Canada has signed the COP23. Um, we are agreeing to be leaders in terms of reducing our greenhouse gases. And that means like from a governmental perspective, most of our departments are making, the deputy ministers are making the commitments. Okay, let us reduce our footprints. That means in terms of real property, let's reevaluate our requirements. So for me, we're naturally downsizing as we're going hybrid. We're, we're committing to examining our leases, which ones we can get out of, what properties can we sell, et cetera. We are huge owners as the Canadian government and we need to rethink about how we work. Does it meet more GC co-working spaces? Oh, I hope so, um, because that would be so convenient for all of us who are dispersed in the suburbs. Um, during the pandemic, some of the, uh, the, the businesses have actually relocated closer to where we live because they realize that the city centers and the traditional centers no longer viable options for them. So I want to see that trend continuing. I see some government commitments towards that trend continuing. I'm happy to see that. Um, and we have a foresight unit. And if you don't know what foresight is, really just go to Policy Horizons. They have a whole tab around training. It's a wonderful field and it's super useful when we're trying to position ourselves to future-proof our services. So our team led an exercise, an interdepartmental exercise recently. Nah, not so recently. It was last April. Um, and we examined from a people management perspective, what are some of the assumptions that we were holding that would be challenged in the future? And one of those would be that um, public servants would continue to work from traditional locations. So urban city centers, the national capital region. Now we're challenging that. That may not be the case in the future. And I truly hope that it won't. So go ahead and read the 72 page masterpiece. It's wonderful, full of insights, and it will help us as the next generation to kind of reflect of, on, on what the federal public service should look like for our future generations. So all hope, but no concrete action. Apologies. Thank you for those lovely answers. Um, I'm having so much fun. I mean, but I'm so just like, you know, so concentrating and listening to you guys that I've forgotten to take notes. So those of you who don't know this session is being recorded, we, we can always listen to them after the fact. Um, so we'll move on uh, to the questions from the audience now. Um, and please remember that you can, so this is to the audience, uh, please remember that you can vote for the questions you like by using the thumbs up. So vote, 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 or just put in your question in, right? Um, and let others vote on it. So our first most upvoted question is, um, can or should you be applying to positions located in the NCR if you're a regional employee with the hope of being able to convince the manager to work regionally? Who wants to take a jab at it? All right, Natasha. This is how I work. I work from London and I work for NCR 99% of the time. I did work for a regional office once uh, working from the regions, but uh, that was where their headquarters was. So it was still kind of headquarters. Um, so this is how I work. I usually work in uh, DMO offices, uh, leading transformation and, and working on some of the, the pieces that go along with the hybrid. Um, and for me, how I've been able to convince people to hire me um, is by 
doing the work and then showcasing what I do. So it's a little bit of branding. It's a little bit of selling yourself and marketing. Um, and unfortunately for people in the regions, we do have to do that a little bit more than the people in the NCR because they get the opportunity of meeting them face to face and, and creating that really nice rapport where we have to push our way into their mailbox a little bit. But I've had no problem being hired remotely. Um, and I have always been amendable to travel if they wanted to pay for it and bring me there. Being uh, a regional employee reporting to NCR, the NJC actually says that they can do that. Um, and that policy does exist. And so uh, we are able to travel um, if the manager is willing to do that. And there is value in coming together. So I've always said when I'm doing my interviews that I would be um, really excited to come and meet people in person from time to time as well. Um, so it doesn't mean that I'm able to do the 40 to 60% a week, but it definitely means that I can maybe go for five days a quarter and hang out with people and do the on-site things that I need to do and then come back and do the uh, things that I can do virtually here. Um, when your work is good and when your work ethic is good, it's not a difficult sell for a manager. Um, because really, I think what we learned from the pandemic, that results-based work is what people value over bums and seats. And even though we have a return to occupancy uh, direction that has come out, there is still flexibility for regional presence and that work from everywhere is kind of woven in a little subliminally. It's hard to see when you're a regional person, but those exemptions allow some of us to have that opportunity to continue working the way that we do. Um, working in the regions is hard, especially when you're working for the region and there's there's nothing at your level or your position or for what you do in your city. Um, so really just keep branding yourself, um, creating those relationships, uh, get yourself a sponsor or a mentor who will speak your name loud and proud for you uh, on your behalf when they are in the NCR and you're not, and uh, try to uh, do a little bit of marketing. May I? Please go ahead. Just add to that, um, yes, 100%. Never hesitate to go for a job, regardless of location, if you really want it. A, follow your heart. B, look out for yourself because no one's going to take your hand and just hand you a job. So like Natasha said, it's a bit of a sell, but go for it because you never know. And it doesn't mean that the current situation uh, doesn't allow or hasn't even been explored that it could be done regionally, that it shouldn't be. So make sure you put yourself out there, make sure you put your talent forward and you never know because there is flexibility. And in terms of hiring talent, it shouldn't really matter where you are physically located as long as you're doing the job. So if we're looking at recruiting the best, then that's what we should be looking at and not thinking, oh, are you in the NCR? Oh, that's a problem. No, it should not be a problem, um, Mr. Tam. Thank you, Jasmine. Well, well said. I'd just like to build on Natasha and Jasmine as well. If you are the third candidate, is this is what your heart is going for? Apply for it. When I first see the question for this, uh, should you be applying for positions for Canada NCR, even you in the region? For sure. Why not? Go for it. If it is something you like, go for it. Keep selling yourself. You are in the driver's seat in your career development. Why not? Right? If you see it, it is for you. Uh, Natasha mentioned, right, um, sh just do the work, show them who you are, just shine brightly at the position and have a mentor, have a sponsor speak loudly for you. Um, why not? I would say 100%, if any one of you in here like to apply for NCI job, you have my support and have a sponsor, go for it. And I will tell every one of you, you can do it, just go for it. Thank you for those words of encouragement. <laughs> Don't be afraid, just go for it. You know, as simple as that. Um, all right, so we have a second question from the audience, a little bit uh, specific. Um, so this person is saying that I was hired during the pandemic and I have been lucky enough that my team supports me to continue to work fully remotely or remote uh, despite the mandate to go back to the office. 
However, I worry about my career mobility for the future as many jobs require NCR based only. And I would prefer not to move. How realistic is it that other departments or agencies will hire me if I'm not based in the NCR? So that's a similar question to what we just answered. I think it this question um, specifically speaks to like the jobs.gc.ca uh, applications where it says you must live in blah, 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 and you must be part of this department and, and so on and so forth. Um, those ones are a little tricky to get around. Um, most of my hiring has been done informally and through social media. So if you're not on social media, get on it because I literally have worked six years off of Twitter and LinkedIn. <laughs> but um, if you're going to apply for a jobs.gc.ca job, I have done it in the past where I've emailed the HR advisor at the bottom, letting them know that I brought value, but I wasn't in the postal code and could I still apply? It's hit and miss. I would say maybe 30% of the time I get a yes, please still apply response. And then the remainder, it's no, it's really set on those postal codes. So there's nothing stopping you from doing it. And um, I think the question talked about like um, moving around. Was, am I right? I'm trying to remember the question now. Yeah. Um, so like as long as you've negotiated with your employer that you have the the ability to work X amount of kilometers away from the office and they've approved it and you've received, you know, your, um, what is that called? Telework agreement and it's in your job description and you are hired that way, then it should be a moot point. If you haven't done that and you start moving around, that's when the employer has the ability to call you back because it was done on your, your decision and not their decision and what's in your contract, you've just now changed. Um, so there are some legalities behind that, but um, they aren't things that can't be worked around if they're conversations and if the manager is willing to change your job description and your working um, box. But again, those, uh, those are conversations that need to happen with senior leaders. There needs to be exceptions now at the ADM level, according to our direction. So um, it's, it's a little trickier. Like if you can have the conversation at the onset of hiring and then stick to it. And if you have to change, like, um, you know, have that conversation again. But like, it's really ideal to have it at the onset of hiring. Thank you. So Jasmine, Alan, I'd like to add to that, or we can move on to the next question. Um, so add on a little bit, uh, we would want to touch uh, said some of the postings on uh, jobs.gc.state unfortunately do have those um, geographical uh, restrictions. Um, it is the posting put it there for a specific purpose. So that is why to put yourself out there virtually using Twitter, using LinkedIn to make those connections. Um, regional employees, you folks, I would say, including myself too, have experience on touching exactly the files, know what's going on in the field. Don't put it there as, oh, this job will not be for me through uh, NHQ. Um, so virtual networking is very key when you would like to, uh, looking for some jobs in the uh, East uh, uh, to report your NCR. Thank you, Alan. Um, Next question from the audience is, um, we have a little bit of time. Yeah, we do. Um, <laughs> I hope you guys are ready for the next one. <laughs> um, so also personal a little bit. Um, this person is saying, I find it feels like a taboo topic to bring up wanting the freedom to move around Canada while maintaining your job. Even though it's been proven most people can do their jobs remotely at this point. Do you have any tips to open the door for this kind of conversation with those higher up? Do you want me to read the con uh, question again? Does anybody else want to lead? <laughs> sure, I may. I may try to uh, try that. So, I think it's a bit. It's a situation where you're wanting to have an awkward and a difficult conversation right off the bat without them necessarily knowing your worth yet. So make sure that what you bring to the table is clear, um, that it is not necessarily a negotiation, but kind of like, um, let's see what can happen. I feel that this conversation is similar to the one when 
some of us are like, Ooh, I'm super pregnant, but I don't know if I should tell you because I don't know if I'm going to, you're going to hire me. Uh, same thing. If you're looking for someone in a specific geographic location, yet I want to move in my heart of hearts. Um, like I said, you want to write, find the right fit for yourself uh, in your career. If moving around is that important, then perhaps it should be clear right off the bat. Some of us have moved uh, because we are maybe a little afraid, okay? Maybe not everyone is brave like Natasha. Uh, maybe we're a little afraid of the consequences and impacts on our careers, but it needs to be clear for yourself and right off the bat, hey, is this a possibility or not? And it goes back to some of the terms and conditions that Natasha, Natasha was referring to. Um, be honest about it. And if the person is reacting, you know, in, in a weird way, maybe that's your cue to be like, mm, maybe this is not the right fit for me in terms of the my manager or uh, of a fit, period. Well, thank you, Natasha. Did you want to add, Alan, anything? No? Okay. Very good. Um, so our fifth question for the audience is, what classification of jobs are most found in regional teams? Uh, this person is saying that they work in policy, but most postings they see are NCR. And having dispersed teams aren't as prominent. Who would like to take a jab at that? I can. There's a lot of different kinds of jobs in the region. So it's hard to say like what positions are in the regions because you have like inspectors, you have engineers, you have scientists, you have administrative, you have program analysts, you have clerical, um, you have, uh, you know, customer service kind of based, which are still administrative, but there's a lot with passport, citizenship, um, you know, there's, there's many different kinds of uh, jobs in the region, but you're right, the policy ones are mostly in Ottawa, the EC positions, especially the higher up positions, the EC like sixes, five sixes. Um, but it's not to say that it's impossible to work in that capacity. Um, you know, competing is hard to do when you're in the regions because of that postal code requirement. Um, but, you know, I've been able to um, send virtual portfolios uh, in email of some of my sampling works uh, to managers to show what it is that I do and what I bring um, and invite them to have a conversation about what value that I have. And a lot of the time I, I'm still allowed to compete through that, um, you know, just demonstration that uh, I still have the same, if, you know, if not just as good uh, skill set that, that everyone else in the NCR has. And then I bring maybe something a little bit different, a different perspective. Um, so, you know, there's nothing stopping people from trying to uh, obtain those roles, but it is, it is a more Ottawa based position for the ECs for sure. I would like to add a little bit of that too. Um, definitely the policy will be more um, in the NCR for in the region, there'll be more jobs, or if you like to use the, the term classifications on, uh, of jobs, which is more program management or, or clerical, because in the region, most of them are in operations side. Um, for example, using the ESDC's example. And in the region, it depends which I would say regional headquarters, uh, if you're looking for, if you're looking for some jobs in the lower mainland BC and Vancouver area, the presence of photo services officer, there may be a bigger presence uh, in, in Calgary, um, it will be the Canada, Canada Energy Regulator. Maybe if you're looking for some policy in that particular field, that may be for you. So it depends um, which in the region that you're looking for. So um, it really depends. But, uh, from understanding to um, the policy will be more um, quarter central. Thank you. Um, so our next question is, how should we approach the upcoming mandatory two to three days when operational needs are not considered and more and more jobs are classified as in NCR? So um, how should we approach the, can you read the question again? Yes, sorry. 
So how should we approach the upcoming mandatory two to three days when operational needs are not considered and more and more jobs are classified as an NCR? So I, again, classified in NCR. So I, I would say that operational needs are being considered and it's probably why the hybrid approach was implemented in the first place so that those operational requirements and needs could be met. Um, and then that would allow sort of the um, the non operational side of position assessments that were done to happen on the offset days. Um, so, you know, I almost like disagree a little bit with the question in general, um, but more and more jobs have have always been classified in the NCR like that's not anything new but people have always worked in the regions and I've been working this way since before the pandemic and I know a lot of people who did too so this isn't a new thing for the government of Canada and they have been hiring this way previously um the mandate exists now it's a return to uh occupancy um, the pandemic was exceptional circumstances, and yes, it was better than working in the office for most people, but um, that was a pandemic situation. And so I think like when we think about it with that mindset, which is kind of like not the, the, the happiest sort of result when there are personal impacts that are happening to people, it's hard to sort of maintain that perspective. Um, and it's it's also hard for like the regional people too. When I think about my colleagues going in two to three days a week and they're able to collaborate and connect and I can't, like I have massive FOMO, I wanna do it too. And I feel left out. And then on the opposite side, the high, the people who are going in are saying, well, Natasha gets to work from home full time. Why don't I like this isn't fair. So there is kind of like an imbalance on both ends of the spectrum. It's just um, trying to find the the perfect equilibrium between the two models that bring the two different types of people and the different types of working models together um and this is where the culture is so important and it's also really like when you're thinking about regional people and how they work and those exceptions it's about equity really like applying that across the board for everyone not just people in the regions but people in the ncr too and uh, and allowing some of that flexibility I do believe that the direction that was given from TBS on the return to office did allow some flexibility because they provided it in a percentage as opposed to at, at end with days per week. So it allowed um, people to choose uh, what worked better for them with their personal circumstances. So like when we're thinking about flexibility now, we think about flexibility and how it fits within that scenario, as opposed to flexibility gave us the freedom to just work the way we want into. Um, so it's a, it's a different mindset. It's a different perspective for sure. It's It's been hard to adopt, but change adaptation has been happening since the beginning of time. I mean, think of when the internet was introduced to the government of Canada, everybody struggled with that. And I'm old enough to remember it because I worked in government when that happened. So, <laughs> so, you know, change adaptation does happen. It does take time. And uh, it's just about sort of finding those algorithms and those equal inclusive opportunities on both sides of the spectrum to make it work. I think there's still work to do. It's not done yet. It's not perfect. We got to figure it out. Yeah, I think we're just starting. And what we have to uh, take into account is the fact that during the pandemic, we hired regardless of location. And now with this return to occupancy, we have to make sure we have physical space, creating these two cultures that Natasha is talking about. Uh, Seas. We hired too many people in the regions and we don't have actual seats for them, whereas the NCR, we have plenty of space, yet some people have moved away from the NCR because quality of life and other reasons. Um, so it's going to be interesting to be able to reconcile uh, those two cultures of like, hey, you're in the regions, oh, can't go back to work because there's not enough space versus go back to the office because you are in the NCR. I know there's space, so go. Um, and we, we don't want to go back to is those two cultures, the, the divide between the regions and the NCR. Like we had abolished that with the equality of the, the squares on the screens. So it would be really unfortunate. That'll be a challenge for the, the new leadership. Um, yeah, I was gonna jump to another question and then to chat, but Jasmine's gonna shut up now. I'd like to add to it's, I think 
for this one is organ progress. We just need to find the right equilibrium. So um, time will tell. And that's all. Why don't we jump on the next question as well? Seems interesting as well. All right. Um, well, I didn't think we'd have time, but we do have about four minutes. Um, so the last question is, are there any considerations one should think of or negatives to attaining a job in NCR from a region? Is it difficult to go back to, to a regional position? I yeah. would say, be careful. Look at the size of the department. Oftentimes, larger departments will have better regional representation. So if that's something that you're after, that's something you may want to look into. Look at the little info-based graphs. They tell you very well, like, oh, most of their staff is actually in Montreal because that's where there's an aerospace industry or whatever. So depending on what it is that you want to do and what you have your heart set on, just do your homework and, and inquire. When you have those informal discussions with the managers, just check if it's an, even a possibility and that will depend on uh, you know them and their representation regionally yeah and um for myself i'm one of those regional employees that has pigeonholed myself into a spot where i actually can't work for the regions anymore what i do is too ncr based as it's too departmental specific supporting a minister is not something you can do in london there are no ministers here so um it's just it's it's uh you have to be careful that you're prepared to continue fighting the fight and selling yourself and working on your portfolio and doing the marketing long term if you're going to put yourself in a position like that. And so um, it's it's really personal decision. You have to weigh the risks, the pros and cons and how it would impact your personal situation and decide if it's a risk you're willing to take. When like first um, the national versus regional again, it's a personal choice. Um, the other panelists also mentioned it to do your homework, right? Is it some? It is a place that you would like to land, like dealing with the policies, dealing with high level communications, or you are very comfortable with dealing with face to face clients in the regional level, uh, dealing with the regional priorities. That this is you are solely that 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 is your thing. That is something you like to go to. So you need to be mindful. Is it that is something I like to do? Because when you're in the national level, reporting at a national level, the, the work that you do at that level um, may not be the same in the, in the region. But, and you go like to, like to go back to your regions, um, the positions for your ranking, your classification, if you go back to the a couple of questions before, that may be a question for you. So it's about personal choice, do your homework, uh, and talk to your hiring manager um, informally about what you're looking for, what they're looking for. So, thanks. Thank you um, for the lovely answers. And that's all the time we have today. Um, it was, you know, time sure flies when you're having fun. And I know you guys are a wealth of knowledge. Um, I know I learned a lot and I will definitely, definitely be looking at those recordings uh, for the next time. And um, if you want to know, for the audience, if you want to know more about any of these topics uh, that CBC has, um, you know, offered uh, this this year, uh, check out the CBC Period Bootcamp CBC uh, 2023 Wiki Resource page. And so before we close off for today, um, and before we end the session today, uh, we have one final polling question. Um, and the results, unfortunately, will not be shared. Sorry, but we'll talk it out. You know, we'll talk it out. So was this session a good use of your time? Yeah. <laughs> For me, it was, at least. Don't know what you guys think. So submit your answers in the poll. And thank you for joining us today. There is an opportunity to network with other government of employees, sorry, government of Canada employees, uh, which will take place on Wonder Me from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The link to all the sessions as well as the networking events can be found on the V Expo. Uh, don't forget to join us for day three of Create Bootcamp on Tuesday, January 24th. And resources uh, will be available on the wiki page and the recording of this event will be available on our YouTube channel or Finn's YouTube channel. I don't own it, they do. There you go. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you panelists for joining us today. And 
see you later. Bye.